So this week we will look at a very, very important moment in the development of American institutions, the rewriting of the laws and constitution to try to deal with the aftermath of the Civil War and the challenges of Reconstruction. Um, here is Andrew Johnson, the president who succeeded Abraham Lincoln. He was nominated for vice president in 1864. We still don't know whether Abraham Lincoln really wanted him on the ticket or not. Uh, it, there's no direct evidence of whether, what Lincoln's position on this was. The vice presidency was a very obscure office back then. Nobody expected Andrew Johnson to become president. A few presidents had died in office, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, but nobody, no president had been assassinated up to that point. Uh, Johnson was a Southerner, as you know. He was the, a Unionist, the only senator from a seceding state to remain in his seat in the Senate when Tennessee seceded. He was military governor of Tennessee in the middle of the war, and as such, he earned a reputation in the North as being very uh, harsh on uh, re rebels. Um, and he was very popular in the North at this, uh, it, it, toward the end of the Civil War. And as a symbol of Southern white unionism, a group which many people, including Lincoln, uh, considerably exaggerated the numbers of, but Johnson would be a symbol of the kind of people who the Republican Party might be able to appeal to after the war when they needed to expand their base into the South. Now Johnson, David Donald, the great historian, called Johnson the most puzzling character in American history. Nobody can really figure out why he did what he did, how his presidency collapsed so quickly. He came into office with tremendous public support uh, rallying around him after Lincoln's assassination. He became the first president ever to be impeached by the Congress and came within one vote of being removed from office and uh, was universally considered a failure at the time. William Dunning, the uh, originator of the old school of Reconstruction scholarship, had no use for Johnson, even though he opposed reconstru radical Reconstruction. He thought Johnson was incompetent and failed to understand the situation at the end of the war and the fact that the North would need some guarantees uh, of uh, proper Southern behavior and just Johnson threw away his power inexplicably. Um, it was only in the 1920s when the really racist view of Reconstruction fully took hold that Johnson emerged as a hero. And biographies of Johnson appeared, the great defender of the Constitution, the, great, the man who stood up against the radicals, the man who tried to save the South from quote unquote black supremacy. Later in the 60s, 70s, 80s, with the revisionism on Reconstruction, Johnson's reputation sank again. But people try to figure out what, what exactly were his motives. Kenneth Stamp called him the last Jacksonian. In other words, he, had a, he was just out of date. He had this vision of the country that dated 30 years previously, and he couldn't understand what had happened as a result of the Civil War. Donald called him a poor white in the White House. In other words, that his views, both his outlook and his limits, reflected the particular outlook of poorer whites in the South. Uh, others thought, no, Johnson wasn't actually all that incompetent. He had a policy. It didn't work. His policy was to appeal to racism to build a coalition around himself, southern whites and many northern whites too. Johnson said, hey, let's make this the fight. Are you for the white man? Stay with me. You're for blacks? Go with the radicals. I'll win that fight, he said. So in other words, the argument was he wasn't he wasn't incompetent, he was staking out a political position. Or others say, no, he wanted to be reelected. The first, anybody coming into office, as Johnson did, would have to think about the prospects of reelection. Where is he going to get a support from? All right, all these uh, theories are out there, um, and they're trying to explain why Johnson's presidency failed so abysmally. Now, one of the games, I've mentioned this before, that historians play when we have nothing else to do with our time is ranking the presidents. And we get these um, polls that are sent around, you know, and charts and rank the presidents. And then, you know, they, they, they always come. Now, Johnson has fallen consistently. Back in, I don't know, in the 1950s, he was up there among the 
let's say, top 10, something like that. He wasn't like Lincoln or Washington, but he was up there. Since the newer view, he's sunk, 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 sunk. The last uh, one that I got of these uh, was a totally absurd, gigantic survey where you're supposed to rank every president in terms of about 10 different categories, you know, foreign policy, economic policy, but also administrative ability. I'm looking at it, I said, Benjamin Harrison's, Benjamin, how am I supposed to rank Benjamin Harrison's administrative ability? Quite honestly, I have no idea of anything that happened under Benjamin Harrison. <laughs> so I threw it in the garbage. Um, <laughs> then when the results came out, Johnson was second from the bottom, just above Nixon. And uh, I said, damn, I could, have, I could have put him over the top or the bottom <laughs> if I had filled out the form and ranked him as. So I think Johnson has a real claim to being the worst president in American history. There is a lot of competition for that, but he's, he's one of the leading contenders. Now, Johnson did grow up as a poor white. In fact, Johnson, you might say, rose the furthest to become president of any president in our history. Lincoln was born in a log cabin, poor, but Johnson was even poorer starting out than Lincoln. He worked as an indentured servant for a while. Uh, he, he, in, he was born in uh, North Carolina, but grew up mostly in East Tennessee. As I say, very poor, but, and he, he rose to, he worked as a tailor for a while. Uh, he rose to power as the spokesman of the non-slave-holding whites of East Tennessee, a place like West Virginia, but didn't manage to break off during the Civil War. Um, and the enemy of the planter aristocracy, not a critic of slavery at all, but feeling that the, what he called the slaveocracy, the rich planters, kind of ran the state to the detriment of the poorer whites, that the, you know, they needed schools, they needed railroad, they needed economic development, and the planters from western Tennessee uh, didn't give anything to East Tennessee, and that was Johnson's you know, rallying cry, as well as many others in that, in that uh, uh, region. Um, he lacked most of Lincoln's personal qualities of greatness. He was completely stubborn, inflexible. Once he took a position, he would not listen to any criticism. He would not consider changing it. Uh, he had no connection with the Republican Party, really, and no, he lacked Lincoln's sense of northern public opinion. Uh, he lacked an ability to work with Congress. Uh, as I say, he couldn't think about compromise. Um, so he wasn't really the man for the job, so to speak, in a really challenging situation. But as I say, I, I think to just call him incompetent doesn't really explain everything. Johnson was very successful in the political system of the 19th century. He had held every office you can, from mayor of Greenville in eastern Tennessee, up to the members of the legislature, the governor of Tennessee, House of Representatives, U.S. Senate. He held a lot more positions than Lincoln did before uh, the Civil War, much more successful in getting elected than Lincoln had been in, in Illinois. Um, so he was hardly unfamiliar with the political system. Uh, just blaming Johnson's lack of political savvy is a kind of a updated version of the blundering generation view of the coming of the Civil War. The situation should have been settled, Reconstruction, but it was just bad political leadership. But what if, what if the crisis was too deep for easy solution? That's another possibility. Um, as I say, I think there is a point to, to, to argue that Johnson did represent this Southern, not just poor whites, but yeomanry. He felt that the planters had dragged, like Lincoln, he thought most Southern whites were loyal to the Union. A conspiracy of big planters had sort of dragged them into secession. Um, he believed that now the planter class had been destroyed by the Civil War. At least he started out thinking that, which was certainly a mistake. As I say, vis-a-vis -vis blacks, he was deeply, deeply racist. Uh, in, in one, uh, he, he told a friend at one point in the Civil War, damn the Negroes, I am fighting the traitorous aristocrats, their masters. But maybe more to the point, Johnson, and you can see echoes of this outlook even today in our, in our politics, Johnson felt that there was a kind of alliance between the rich planters and the, and the blacks and the slaves and former slaves. If you gave black men the right to vote, they would vote with the planters. 
as I say, you hear that around today in terms of a kind of liberal alliance of the well, to, you know, the, 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 I don't know how many people have ever heard of this, some of a, of a certain generation, the iconic moment, Leonard Bernstein's party for the Black Panthers on the Upper East Side of New York in the late 60s was taken as a symbol of this kind of thing. You know, the limousine liberals and the black radicals with the white in the middle being ignored. Uh, I think this is a very limited view of things, but that was Johnson's view. Um, now Johnson, his aim, he said, was to empower the yeoman farmers of the white South after the Civil War. As I say, he didn't think blacks should have any political role in the, um, in, Reconstruction. And sometimes he expressed himself in ways which were really deeply racist. So, for example, in 1866, after a meeting with a black delegation headed by Frederick Douglass, he remarked to his private secretary, who wrote this in his diary, we have the diary of Johnson's secretary, those damn sons of bitches thought they had me in a trap. I know that Douglass, he's just like any nigger. He'd sooner cut a white man's throat than not. So this is not the attitude that's going to make him sympathetic to black aspirations after the Civil War. Or in 1867, in his annual message to Congress, Johnson declared that black people had shown less capacity for government than any other people in the world, and when left to their own devices, they exhibited a tendency to relapse into barbarism. This is probably, maybe not, probably the most overtly racist statement ever made in a public document of an American president. Whatever their private views, most didn't declare black people to be barbarians.